In this passage of scripture, Jesus is in the middle of teaching about what it means to be a follower, follower of God the Holy One. Just before this passage, Jesus blessed children as ones to whom the kingdom of heaven belongs. Moments after, a rich man encourages, engages with Jesus, seeking to take his faith another step. May the Lord add God's blessing to the scripture reading this morning. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And the young man asked of Jesus, Which commandments? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your mother and father. Also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Holy words for God's people. Thanks be to God. I think about like when the psalmist says, um, you know, let the wind praise the Lord, let the cattle praise the Lord, let the beasts of the water praise the Lord. And I think, well, what does that mean? How is a, how is, how would a cattle praise the Lord? And I think it's by being cattle. Like cattle never think they're not, that they're God, right? And so there's a, this sort of right relationship, creator and created. Um, and that is the worship of God, just that relationship being intact. And there's, there's different ways of saying like, I have a relationship with God. And yeah, okay, one of those ways of saying, it's important to me that I have a relationship with God is like having quiet devotional time in the morning and just really feeling like you're, you're bros with God and like, and you know it, that you're bros with God because your life is like easy and placid and you've nailed the Christian lifestyle and you're perfectly righteous and you never really need to bother God with that grace and forgiveness and mercy thing because you got it covered, right? Now, another way to be in relationship with God is to be a creature of God's creating and to be a mortal, flawed creature that needs God for particular things, not just for life and sustenance, but also for mercy and forgiveness. That's a right relationship with God, is to say, like, I'm somebody who needs you. Like, I can't get this right, and I keep messing things up, and I keep making the same mistakes over and over, and I think of myself too often. Whatever it is, that confession of our humanity puts us in right relationship with God, meaning now God can enter in and make something beautiful out of our broken stuff. Uh, we rob God of that too often when we go, no, it's not broken, it's good. Look, I'm gonna clean it up here, a little scotch tape, we're good, I don't wanna bother you. Um, I'd rather be in a relationship with God that means that God is sort of, that there's that intercession of mercy and forgiveness all the time. appreciate the Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber's words there. She's a pastor in Colorado. She does some amazing things. She just came out with a book. I encourage you, if you want some uh, challenging and wonderful things to learn more about it, check out some of the stuff she's doing. It's really powerful. Um, we're going to continue our sermon series and actually conclude it today on this series called Selfie. And as, the more I thought about it, um, the more I realized that social media is becoming increasingly uh, something that's happening in our world that's becoming less and less of an option for us if we really want to engage in what the world is doing. And social media is a big umbrella. A lot of things fall under that. But it's a tool 
that's now available in multiple ways for us to really, truly begin to engage with one another. So let me pull you a little bit, and this is a chance for you to raise your hand if you want to. Have you heard of Airbnb before? It's a way of engaging. If you don't want to find a hotel to live or to stay for a few days when you go on a vacation, you can use a social media tool to rent somebody's space out, either their entire home or parts of their home. Did you know that Airbnb, as of December the 1st, 2014, said that they have 20 million users at this time? If you're not familiar with Airbnb, how about y'all who've engaged with Instagram? Do you know what that is? Instagram has, um, as of September 22nd, 2015, their latest polling shows that they have 400 million active users on Instagram, which is a way of sharing photos and memes and, and a way of sharing what you're doing and where you're going. Their daily users hover around 75 million people every day who are active on Instagram. As of March 31st, 2014, Facebook noted that they have 1.55 billion users. So to put that in perspective, there's almost 8 billion people in the world. So more than one in seven people are on Facebook in the world right now. Of those numbers, 72% are said to have logged in every day. And the daily users of Facebook are just north over one billion a day. One in seven people on the face of the earth regardless of our technological ability, are able to access it, are on Facebook. And those who are on Facebook, of that one billion, 65% use it for more than 20 minutes a day. And my response was, just 20 minutes? Oh. Okay, that was supposed to be really funny. <laughs> Maybe it's more my confession. We're not going to stop there, are we, Pastor Joe? All right. Um, you know what's going on in the world today. I didn't know that there's a tool on Facebook that popped up. I have a couple of friends who live in Paris right now. And this tool popped up called Safety Check. And what it is is in times of natural or unnatural disaster, Facebook has this module that you can use to tell your friends and family on Facebook that you're safe. You see, I found out that my friends were safe in Paris before I even knew what was happening in Paris. I thought that was a really interesting shift in today's culture. One of the challenges, though, in social media and what's happening today that I personally find is mixing social media and receiving news content. Because when I look at social media today, I have the ability to customize it any way I want to. Actually, if I don't customize it, the algorithms, algorithms, the, thank you, Drew. The formulas in which those who create the social media platforms use are based off of how I engage in my social media. Through my inactions and my actions, I can customize how I see my news. And I am built in such a way that actually most of the news I get initially comes through social media. It's not all the news I get, but most of the news I get through my news feeds and my phone come through that. So here's one confession. I heard about what's happening in Paris through Facebook before I saw it in the news itself. How many people might resonate with that? Decent amount. You know what's happened in Paris. Uh, but you know what? I have another confession for you. I didn't know what happened in Beirut and Baghdad. I didn't know about the 40-some people who died or suicide bombings and the tragedy that happened, the 200-plus who were injured in those spaces and places just hours before what happened in Paris. And I'm sure you've heard about all the things happening in Paris, so I'm not going to unpack that. Pastor Joe has a great prayer for us in that time he's going to talk about in a bit. But you know what? I can't really keep talking to you about what's been going on in our world unless we pray together. So will you please pray with me? Gracious and loving God, for sermons that were written on Tuesday and had to be rewritten on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, we give you thanks. For where we are right now as a people, the diversity that is represented here in your church, we give you thanks. For however we're trying to unpack what's happening in our worlds, whether it be work or school, how we engage with the news, how we engage with social media, we lay it at your feet. And we say, God, will you please do something new today? And we also question you, God, and saying, where are you in the midst of this tragedy? Where are you in the midst of what's happening in our hearts right now? And we know that you are a God who can handle our joys just as much as you can handle our concerns, just as much as you're a God who can handle our questions. So may this be a time, O oh God, where we can engage with you, the living and loving God. Amen.
If you've got your Bibles, turn to them. Will we, uh, open your Bibles, please. Matthew chapter 16, or 19, verses 16 to 24 is what we're looking at. Here we have um, Jesus, who's talking to a rich young ruler. I always want to take note and pause for a second whenever we don't know the name of the person. We don't, we don't know why this person is rich. We know they're young, but what is young? And we know it's a ruler or a man, depending on the translation. But clearly, the author of the Gospel of Matthew is saying something about this person in a real and significant way. And something that really popped when I was reading this passage over and over, trying to understand where God is speaking, both then and now, was this engagement with the rich young ruler with what's happening with the Ten Commandments. Because Jesus chooses to quote the Ten. We had a sermon series on the Ten this summer, uh, but what's interesting here is he doesn't quote the whole Ten, does he? He chooses to quote six of the Ten. When Jesus is talking to this rich young ruler, obviously there are lots of people around them who are pressing in, trying to listen to what Jesus has to say to this young ruler. Parents in this day and age would recite to their children the story of Yahweh or God's salvation of the Hebrew people. They are following Deuteronomy chapter 6. Recite them to your children. Put them on your doorposts. This is something that culturally, for the Hebrew people, they would do all the time. So when Jesus is quoting the ten, these ten sayings, these ten commandments you can find in Exodus 20 and in other places, this is something that's ingrained in society, especially for the Hebrew people. Rabbis would teach their people in the temple about the story of God. So when Jesus takes what they know that is familiar and chooses to shift it a bit, that's when everyone's ears perk up a bit. And we're going to talk a bit more about that. He highlights these. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. And then Jesus does something really interesting. He throws a twist in there. And we'll talk about that in a second. So pin that for me, will you? He adds something that's not actually in the original 10 you can find in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy. It's interesting, though, that he doesn't mention the very first four commandments. Actually, it's the kind of the ones that a lot of us know, right? What are those four commandments? Don't um, put God first, essentially. Have no other idols. Don't take God's name in vain. And then the fourth, which pastors love to talk about, Sabbath. Make sure you take your Sabbath. But Jesus chooses to take those and just knocks them out of there. The first four commandments that talk about our relationship with God and then bridges our relationship with creation, Jesus doesn't talk about at all. Instead, Jesus chooses the last six with a twist and says, if you as a rich young ruler want to live a life that you are called to live, eternal life, there's lots of translations for this, if you want to live the life you're asking about, focus on these. So here we have a young man who's approaching Jesus, calling him a teacher, which is a natural way of engaging in a theological discussion. It's the way you do it back then. And he's asking, what action must I take to inherit eternal life? Throughout scripture, all the gospels, most of the times when people interact with Jesus, they're asking, how do I live the life I'm called to live? We can find that in so many different situations. Check out John chapter 3. There we have a Pharisee who is a leader of the Jewish people, an interpreter of scripture. And he comes to Jesus and also calls him rabbi or teacher. And in John chapter 3, this Pharisee says he, he wants to engage in a deep theological discussion. Now, for the Hebrew people, both then and now, that's the way you engage in the Hebrew scriptures. It's not just, tell me what it is, I'll copy the answer. It's, it's a dialogue, it's a debate. It's living in that gray matter of faith where you can find God who is redemptive and amazing. And what happens in John chapter 3 is Jesus talks not just to his head, but he touches his heart and he calls him into action with his hands. Move forward to chapter 4. Here we have Jesus who's talking to a woman from Samaria, which is a neighboring town from where they are, where a very famous well is. You, you may have heard the story of the Samaritan woman near the well. She comes by midday, which is significant to know. That's another sermon for another time. But here's what's important. This woman comes to Jesus, and she is known in all the places around her for all the wrong reasons. And Jesus breaks countless boundaries, not only by talking to her, by engaging with her. Not only with engaging with her, he talks about how he knows her heart, he knows her actions and her inactions, he talks about God's love, which will quench a thirst she doesn't even truly know is there yet. 
Jesus clarifies all of her actions, her struggles, and he compels her to go to her neighbors and her places to change her town in a way that they have never seen before. And you can read that in John chapter 4. So all of this is to say, when Jesus interacts with people, when they come to him, he's building a reputation for when you come and talk to me, things are going to change, things will be different. But that's not really what's happening in Matthew chapter 19. Why? Because it's set up totally differently. It's not a woman with a bad reputation or a Pharisee who might be trying to trap Jesus. It's a rich young ruler. Now, here's the truth, which is really kind of beautiful and unfortunate. Back then, and I think in many ways, even today, if you were found to be healthy, a person of influence, and a person of means, we equate that unintentionally or intentionally by someone who is blessed by God. The reverse of that must be true if we believe that. And the reverse of that is, if you're unhealthy, if you're down and out, you're struggling, if you're in the margins of society, maybe, just maybe, you're not blessed by God. So here's this young man who's coming to Jesus as a rich young man, somebody that people probably knew who he was for whatever reason that he made his money. And he's asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I wonder, I really wonder, if he's asking for another like in Facebook terms. I'm wondering if he, as a famous person of influence, is looking for validation that the life he's leading is already the right path. And he's looking to add Jesus on his bucket list of all the people who validate my life as it is. This part reminds me of how we, how I, often engage in social media. It's very hard for me, as a father, as a husband, um, at, really as a pastor, to not to um, value my ability to be effective as a minister, to be effective as a human being, to be somebody who's popular, for lack of better terms, by not measuring how many Facebook friends I have, by not measuring how many people engage whenever I say I'm crowdsourcing a question, by not measuring how many people will like a picture if I put pictures of my three girls up, by not measuring my value based off of how many people like and engage in what I already know to be true, or what I believe to be true. One example is something that happened what feels like a lifetime ago. Do you remember that controversy with the red cup? Doesn't it feel like it was a lifetime ago? At the time, it like consumed social media. And then all of a sudden, it became the most pointless thing in the world. Now, I'm not going to tell you about the social media stuff with Red Cup, because that's not the point. What I realized, though, is when I posted the question, because I really didn't get it, I was honestly asking my Facebook friends, what is it about this that is controversial, because this doesn't seem like an issue to me? I got a lot of comments from my perspective, but all the comments validated what I already believed. And then I got really sad because I realized I was asking a question to people who already believe what I believe, who already agree with what I agree with, and I realized I, I'm not as diverse on social media as I thought I was. I realized even though I meant to learn more, for the most part, everybody on social media with me said, this is a silly thing, we can just move past this. But I know somewhere out there, we know there's a guy who started this, but I know somewhere out there there are people who genuinely struggle over this, how do I have a heart for that which I do not know? Was my question. Far too often I find myself engaging in social media and all the networks I have, unintentionally trying to validate what I already believe and not truly asking where is God in the midst of what is happening in this moment. I wonder, I seriously wonder if that's what this rich young ruler was doing when he went to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I wonder if he was asking for validation for what he already believed to be true. Because nothing, it seems like, in this point in his life, challenged that he needed to grow and do and be more. Because he had validation all the way around, through wealth, through influence, through money. Everyone knew him not by his name, but by what he was able to do and what he had accumulated. I wonder if that's the trend that we're making and going towards in social media. Check out Asina O'Neill if you want to Google that. One young woman's perspective who um, identifies herself as an Instagram model who talks about the smoke and mirrors of social media. Now, that's one person's perspective. There's a lot more to that. But there's a lot happening in social media today. I wonder if this is what the 
man was asking for when he talked to Jesus. And I also wonder if this is what he bargained for, because Jesus gave him a whole lot more, didn't he? Maybe that's why Jesus scoffs at him when he says, why do you call me good in Matthew 19? Maybe that's why Jesus chose to push aside the first four commandments of the ten and says, you and God are good? Okay. What are you and God's creation doing? What are you doing with these likes, the social media responsibility, all that you have here? In the Methodist tradition, we call this social holiness and personal piety. We believe that when we have a direct relationship with God that is growing, that is transforming, that is marinating in our hearts, then we have an absolute responsibility to social holiness. We also believe that if we're engaged in the world to make the world the way God calls us to be, that we have a deep responsibility to be engaged with God in a personal way. One doesn't work without the other. If one does without the other, then we question discipleship in that way. That's my words, not the Methodist Church. Because social holiness and personal piety must be hand in hand. And if they're not then maybe something might be missing. This rich young man did not get another like. Instead, he got this concept of perfection. There's a theologian um, who does some great work interpreting the Gospel of Matthew. His name is Donald Sr. He talks about this word perfection. Um, the, the word is teleios, which I want to make sure I quote it correctly, which is the word for perfect, meaning end or goal. But the root of the word is telos, which is becoming complete or whole, rather than a static perfection. This word is used in one other significant place on the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus taught that loving one's enemy made one person complete or perfect as God is complete or perfect. Did you hear that? To move to perfection is not a static state of being, but rather it's moving toward a completeness and truly giving away of oneself. So I'm going to interpret it this way. What if, when you and I are called to be a people of faith, trying to balance social, me social holiness and personal piety, it's not about getting to a state where people will generate likes with us, but it's about a state of giving away of oneself, of denial and of confession. What if we viewed perfection not as an ultimate state of being, but rather a moving toward this journey of lifting up others? What if we focus on an organic growth rather than a complete state? What if we took our initial responses that we find in social media and we named it for what it is, and we offered to God where it might be? As I said before, I learned about Paris before I learned about Beirut and Baghdad. I'm guessing most of us might have experienced that as well. There's nothing really wrong with that. But what we do with how we learn and how we listen is an incredible responsibility as a people growing in faith. Right now, I'm praying for those who are suffering from acts of terrorism in Beirut and Baghdad and Paris. Right now, I'm praying for those who are still crossing dangerous waters, hoping that the place where they find land will allow them to call it home. Right now, I'm praying for those who seek to do harm, for those who are voiceless, disenfranchised, and absolutely our media. I pray for that which is seen and that which is unseen. I pray for the hearts that are full of pain or apathy or empathy. And I'm also trying really hard to genuinely pray for those hearts that are full of hate right now. I pray for those who face acts of terrorism and torture every day in their homes. Since we had this joint venture as a community, I'm praying for those 3,800 folks who have been named as unsheltered in King County alone. I pray that I may hear the voice of justice as well as we may hear the cry of those seeking mercy. I'm praying for a way and a path to know how to respond to what's happening in our world today because I believe without a shadow of a doubt the world does not have to be the way it is today. I refuse to consider that this world is business as usual. I reject the notion that people get what's coming to them. I've tasted of a world and a love of God as intoxicating, is free, and ridden of guilt. I'm addicted to Jesus' love in all the positive and healthy ways. I've tasted it, and I've seen it for just a few moments. You know, the moments where I see it the most is when we take communion together. It's that moment of physical 
personal confession that we can't earn a place at God's table, but we can still receive a grace that we can't possibly respond to, but we get to. You know, in the sacrament of baptism, we confess that Jesus is Lord over life, just as Jesus is Lord over death. In these two sacraments, we see a visible means of grace that is really, really hard to hold, but we get to open with open, we get to hold with open hands. I believe in my heart that this world is really messed up right now. Not all of it, but there are parts. There are people, for some reason, whose hearts are so full of hatred that they're willing to take the life of another. And I believe it doesn't have to be this way. And I believe in my heart that we can be a part of changing the world the way it is today. Did you know in uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 51 to 52, there's this incredible verse as Jesus is making his way toward his, in his last week of life before he's resurrected again. Um, there's this verse, let me pull it out for you. It's powerful. It reads like this. A certain young man was following Jesus, wearing nothing but a linen cloth, and they caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. It's, it's a really uh, a weird verse to insert in this entire gospel. It's not found anywhere else in the gospels. It's not found anywhere else anywhere. And some theologians, which I choose to agree with, ask the question. They wonder if this man who ran away naked might have been the completion of the same man who met with Jesus, as we can find in Matthew chapter 19. You see, at the end, in verses 22 to 26, we heard it. The rich man walked away, for he had great wealth. I take hope that maybe the authors of the Gospel of Mark, maybe they chose to insert this passage in Mark 14, 51 to 52, to give us a glimmer that maybe we don't know exactly how to change the world we're called today. Maybe we don't know exactly how to sell everything we have for the sake of the kingdom. But there is a chance where we might get it. And when we hear it, when we believe that calling, we can die into self for the sake of the kingdom. I'm going to ask you to keep praying with me and keep asking the question and keep stating that this world doesn't have to be the way it is today. That our world can be a better place. We can seek God's kingdom. We're a place where none may question if they have a seat at the table. Where all may know that God's love is for them. Maybe it starts with us. If it doesn't, where will it start? I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But it starts with knowing that God has a better plan than what we have today. I'll give my life for that. I'll give everything I have. I'll keep asking the question and keep listening until I hear how to follow and how to lead. Will you join me in this kind of prayer? The kind of prayer that says that this world doesn't have to be this way. Pray with me, please. Loving and gracious God, for who you are and, and, and the ways that you call us to be, you have gifted us uniquely for just such a time as this. Lord, I'm so mad right now. I, 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 I am angry. I'm upset. Not in the negative ways, God, but your creation is hurting itself. That which we do not know, we fear, O oh God. So may we come to know you in a real and personal way. May the world know of your love that is truly transformative and intoxicating. May we take one more step to be the church you call us to be. May we lay aside pomp and circumstance and lay our hearts at your feet. For you are worthy. You are more than able to help us to bring the kingdom the way you call us to be. May we be the kind of church, O oh God, that serves not just with our heart, not just with our head, but also with our hands. This we ask in your son's name, confessing we're not there yet, but we believe with you we can be.